and we're live. Vincent Bryant, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, bro. What's going on? What is up? So tell me first, what's a little something we don't know about you? Uh, I'm number four out of six kids, my mom's kids, but I'm my dad's only son. I'm the only kid, so that's cool. And you're from? St. Louis, Missouri. What was life like growing up? Uh, it depends on the day. Most times it was cool. Childhood was dope. Um, so I started living with my father from zero to 12. So I was the only child. But then I had to adjust moving with my mom and siblings. So it was an adjustment. I still have only child syndrome, but I also have middle child syndrome. So it's a mixture of those two worlds inside of me. It was dope, though. Do you have a favorite childhood story? Uh, Favorite childhood story? I don't know. I, mean, I ran away from home successfully. Oh. Three or four times. So Tell I'm me. pretty good at it. <laughs> Uh, you know how most times people I'm run away and they fall asleep in their backpack. I actually left and I walked to my grandma's house <laughs> like five miles. And my uncle used to talk to me about that all the time. He's like, "Well, I knew that you were gonna be okay because if you didn't like something, you would leave, and that's the sign of a a cool person." You know what I'm saying? And what were the reasons that you ran away? I just didn't want a whooping. I was probably misbehaving in school or some shit. I was like, nah, "I'm not for an ass whooping today. I'm good." <laughs> so I left, and I was like, "I'm gonna go with my grandma until my dad calms down." And it worked. We went and got ice cream. But that was very dangerous of me, seven year olds just walking the streets of St. Louis with a sharpened pencil just in case somebody was trying to jump on some bushes or something. But hey, I made it. I'm here. You are here. And um, so talk to us a little bit about how you got into comedy and if you can remember the first time you did stand up or were you were you naturally like a, a funny kid? I think so. My father was like um life of the party type of dude, so you see how he interacts with people. He's like, oh, okay, that's how you're supposed to interact with people. And I, I always, I was bouncing around. I moved around a lot. So humor would be my way into new schools or meeting new people and chilling. But I didn't start doing stand-up until I was a senior in college, uh, my first semester. It was, it was cool. But my first mic, it was at a bar. And I had, it was probably maybe like six comics and two regular people. And it went terrible. But I got one laugh from a comic named Kenny Kynes and, it wasn't even a real, it was like, it was a comics laugh. What we do is, ha, that was funny. And we don't really laugh. Or well, you can see a row of comics sitting at a show, and they're not laughing. You're like, what's wrong? They're like, well, They had a great time. They're like, oh, this comic is great. We did not laugh one time, but we just really just back there analyzing. But so, and I was hooked since then. I remember what I had on, too. I had on a yellow hoodie, fatigue pants, and some speed, some diamond turfs, which are Deion Sanders tr cross trainers. I remember that, yeah. And you said, how old were you? Uh, at that time, I was 24. Okay, so it's only four years ago. Yep. And so from, so what did you do before? Oh, before, I was in, uh, I was working in the mental health field before it was cool. Yeah. Oh. So now I was working with people that had developmental disabilities, uh, people that were on, this, well, everybody's on the spectrum, so people that had severe autism, uh, high behavior kinds, and uh, while also going to school full time. So that's what I was doing. Okay, and then at what point did you tell yourself, I'm going oh, to comedy yeah. full time? After I got a probation and from St. Louis, I was, I couldn't leave. So once you're on probation, you can't leave state lines. So after I got off, which was uh, the fall of 2015, I just packed my shit up. And no, yeah, mm, was it the fall? Yeah, it was the fall of 2015, and I packed my shit up and I left. And so, I went to Chicago. So, right, so we were talking about it before mm -hmm. um, we went live. So you went... Basically, your whole life until you're 24, you're in St. Louis, mm -hmm. and then you go to Chicago, and you At call 26. it... 26. Okay. Yeah. And then you call it kind of like your training Yeah. Ground. So, because I, I, I was either going to go to New York or Chicago first, and New York is cool, but it was I had never been on my own um, outside of, so I was just like, all right, let me go here, let me develop my act a little bit more. And I could have went to New York and seeing how everything played out, and I would have been just just as fine. But New Chicago is great for stand-up because you can get up three or four times. You can fail there, too, versus where you come to New York or L.A. and you you showcase. And you, not you, in New York, you showcase more so for comics and, and getting their right of passage. But in L.A., you showcase for the industry, and you don't want to be seen too early by either of them because then, you know, how once people see you as one thing, it's just hard to break that mold. And how did you, how, what's your, your, your process with working on jokes? And will you tell us also a little bit like your worst bombing story thus far? Mm, process is always changing. It's always evolving, always getting better. But uh, most times you, I create some shit on the fly or I pull it from conversation. I'm talking to somebody. I'm like, oh, I like that line. Or I, I'll just overhear some stuff and then I'll think about it. Most times mm, some of my best stuff I have to care about it. 
and not like deeply care, but it has to move me some type of way emotionally. It's like I gotta feel like it's really stupid, or I don't agree with it, or it's like, oh, I like that, or it's something has to move me about it to make me write about it. Um, worst bombing story. Hmm. Bombing, 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 bombing. I bomb a lot, which is cool with me because if I'm not bombing, I'm not trying out new shit. I'm just relying on other stuff. So my worst bomb story probably in St. Louis. We had this brutal room every Sunday, and that's how often I was getting up. I was getting up like once a week in St. Louis. That's another reason I moved. It was a very brutal room. People smoking cigarettes, smoking weed. It was very. It wasn't really set up for stand up, especially for amateur comics. So, so starting out, but it was an audience. But they was tough, man. Um, I had been going there for like three weeks, and I was just working on. I had like five or six minutes, maybe. Probably not even that. I probably had a one good joke, and I was closing with it all the time. And I was just about to start with it. She's like, I don't want to hear that joke again. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. Like, that's all I got. She was like, well, get your ass off stage. I was like, okay. And I just listened. I was so green. I didn't know how to navigate her hollering at me. So, yeah, that was probably the worst one. And how do you deal with, with hecklers generally now? Now? I don't know. People don't bother me. So it doesn't happen too often. But once you I, – I include them because I want people to be there. And most times people just want to be a part of the show. I read this somewhere and I learned from watching when people are talking to you. So you include them. And if they get belligerent, you just turn the crowd on them so I don't have to do the work. Because most people, they pay man, they pay up to $6,100 for the evening out. So it's just like if one jackass is running, you just turn a whole mob of people on them instead of making me look like a bad guy. And how many times over the course of a, of a set do you is it rehearsed or you just kind of go off the top of your head mm, it just depends if i'm being paid i'm just do, i'm gonna do shit that works because i'm being paid and i'll throw something in. if i'm getting bored i'll throw something out or i throw out a new line uh the mic though is just me riffing and just i'll probably write out or have people write something out and i'll just try to go in on it and just figure it out that's pretty fun too you just have the audience members Write some shit out for you. Like, okay, I, I can think of it, something funny about this. And how comfortable do you feel, or even in the last, I mean, we started at 24, so last like three, four years, from the beginning to now, mm -hmm. how has your comfort on stage developed? Do you, do you get nervous ever? Do you? Hell yeah. I get nervous all the time. What's the feeling like before you get on stage? Mm, it just depends. Like really big moments, it's just like, all right, lock in, figure it out. Calm down. A funny story. When I first started, I was super, super, super nervous. Uh, made my first real show. I we were doing like I don't know. This is funny because it's the urban side to comedy, and then it's the mainstream. Well, not mainstream. It's the other side of comedy. So before urban shows, we usually pray. So we pray for show. <laughs> so we were in the praying and holding hands, and I'm shaking uncontrollably. And everybody, and the people next to me just stand there looking at me like, hey, calm down, relax. And I was just really nervous. But now it's just like a um, butterflies. And then also it depends on if I'm on like the third show of the night, I don't, I'm not nervous at all. Now I'm just focusing on what I want to say. And I would be more frustrated if somebody interrupts me then because now I'm locked in versus uh, the first show of the night because it's always the little jitters. It's like, okay, well, these people like what I have to say. But my comfortability on stage is always been pretty much the same. I've always been comfortable. Even in the beginning, that's when people complimented more. Now, so it's the material versus how relaxed I am and how conversational I make. And who did you grow up kind of admiring or do you see as like a role model in the, in the comedy world? Mm, I used to love, uh, I used to watch Steve Harvey, Jamie Foxx. I think I'm nothing like, I'm nothing, I'm not as talented as him. This dude is just amazing. Uh, but I watch a lot of Jamie Foxx, I watch a lot of Martin. Uh, and then around middle school, the Chappelle show came out, and the goofiness of the show. I remember him having the the puppet characters, and they was just like a his version of Sesame Street. I just remember that sketch particularly. It was just like, oh, you can be silly and still be smart. So I, I was really intrigued by that. And then uh, Aaron Magruder, who the creator of Boondocks, uh, I used to really like enjoy that type of humor. So those kind of shaped and molded who I am. Did you get to? Have you met any of them? No, not yet. Probably soon enough, though. It always happens. You bump across people. I was stood in the hallway with Dave, and I was like, oh, shit, that's Dave. And I was just chilling, though. He had to play it cool. Even if you feel like on the inside, he's like, all right, play it cool. I'm pretty sure he could felt that play it cool energy. I was like, I was like, I want to shake his hand, but nah. I'm cool, too. And there's also, so 
you're now on, or it's coming out soon. Uh, your your episode, or I don't know what's the the breakdown of it of uh, Kevin Hart's. Oh yeah, set. it already came out. It came out in June. It, it okay, it came out in June. Mm-hmm. Um, so because there's the there's the Comedy Central mm-hmm. um clip, like the big famous one, I think. Yeah. Um, the one that with the the cheating and yeah, 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 that yeah. one. So that's part of Heart in the City. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's the one that came out in June. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Just to make sure. Um, so what was it like, kind of being on that and then. Uh, you know, I've watched an interview with you and or there's Kevin Hart and mm-hmm. you um, around a table. Uh, what's it like being in the room with Kevin Hart and someone of that? Uh, super f- professional. I'm pretty sure he had did like 10 other things that day, but he came in and like this. It felt like this was his first thing doing it. So it was like, oh, shit. And you just tell like the stuff that he posts, like he really works hard. Yeah. <laughs> like this motherfucker. He's at the top. He's like, damn, I need to. Wake up a little earlier, do something a little bit better, because I, I, the energy that he was he was giving off, it was cool being on set. Um, and set it up. So first we first we shot one part. This is the power of uh, magic of you. I hope I ain't spilling the beans too much. But so we shot the first part in June of uh 2017, hey, 2017 or 2018, uh 18. We shot in June of 18, and then that was in June, and then. That part with Kev and the little interview segment, that was shot in August. So, because I think his, he had a schedule conflict, he couldn't come to the cities to do individual like he was doing them at first. So, we just all met there in the studios in August. And we got a free trip to LA out of it. So, that shit was cool. And how did that kind of, that whole production come about? Or who reached oh, out to who? Okay. So, it was, uh, so they go to the local city showcasing talent. So, it was like maybe 10 to 20 comedians. Uh, from St. Louis, uh, vying for spots on that, and I just did what I had to do. I got it done. I kind of knew I was gonna get on though. I just felt it. I was like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna get on TV from this. Did you have, have you ever felt like you had one particular breakthrough moment, or no. do you still feel like it's it's coming? It's coming. Well, mm, I'm here. I'm people out there. I, so I did Montreal, which was in '18. All this was in a row. So it's kind of, that's kind of a milestone within the career. It's like, oh, at this at the three to four year mark, I got here. Okay, now the industry knows who I am. I'm still looking for that. It's the next hump now. It's about booking something or selling something, proving that you can make money to your managers and your, and your representation. So that's the hump I'm trying to get over now. Do you have particular goals? In mind? Yeah, yeah. Like, so, uh, mm, I want to sell out the Fox Theater back in St. Louis. So whatever it, I have to do to get that done, I'm going to do that. And that's a four thousand seater, I think. So, I think I get it done. Do you have a lot of friends back in St. Louis that have done comedy as well? Uh, a few, a few. I got, I gained friends through stand up. I got two in particular. Uh, both of them just moved to New York recently. Who? Stephon Hightower, and Reggie Edwards. Reggie Edwards is a comedian uh, slash battle rapper. Very hilarious. If you see a battle rapper, you're like, this dude is fucking hilarious. He's funny on stage as well. Stephon is very funny on stage. He's an actor. Um. And train and theater and all that stuff. So those guys back home, Cameron Keys, Jason Jenkins, those two guys, uh, I made friends in the community back home. And do you feel like you have a responsibility to represent St. Louis? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Because it, it, it's just a lineage of great comics. Said, Dick Gregory, Red Fox had passed through there. Uh, I think Moms Maybe is also was born in St. Louis. I'm not. Don't quote me on that, but it's one of the other, one of her. Uh, so yeah, it's a responsibility because it's not that many of us, uh, out and about. So when we are, you know, you just want to make sure that St. Louis is represented well. And how did your family feel when you started going into comedy and then, you know, devoted full time to it? Uh, my mom was a little like, Hey, what are you going to, I graduated and I got my degree and I was like, mm, I don't really want to do shit else after this. I just want to do comedy. And my mom she said maybe one or two things. Was like, hey, you should look into law school. And I was like, mm, I'm not doing that shit. But other than that, my family's been supportive as much as they can be. It's like, oh, you're doing a thing. That's cool. Have fun. And, yeah, it's been like that. They come out to shows every once in a while. I, I'm, a lot of my family has seen me perform. They like it. So. Do you like having family or friends there? Does it? I don't mind. It's whatever. Uh, it's cool. Um, I don't invite. This is a weird thing. I don't invite uh, people I'm dating out. Because it's Why my not? job. Okay, but you don't want them to see what what you do. Yeah, they can see it on TV for bigger moments. Yeah, you can come out for bigger moments. But if it's just like a regular show, it's just like mm, I don't have, need you there. Have you ever had somebody that you're dating come to a show? Yeah, 
I don't like it. I don't. Well, I don't not like it. It's just like I would prefer that they weren't there. Uh, Which is I don't know why. It's just like mm, interesting. Unless I have my invite, invite them. Like for the TV taping, I was with someone at the time, and I kind of the Comedy Central her, one. Yeah, I wanted her there because that was a moment. I was like, okay, I need somebody to. You're also talking about cheating on it, so yeah, get, get, yeah, get, get a point across. Yeah, too. that was yeah. It was just like, hey, pay attention. <laughs> oh, I'll make a joke out of all this. Uh, but yeah, it was cool. But most times, it's like that's my job. I don't really want to do all that. And damn it, Andrew. <laughs> Nah, it's all good. I want to keep it in. It's, it's funny because last time on Nick, when we had Nico on, um, Josh, the other one, also dropped like a camera, and it was like probably I think twenty minutes in as well. So at yeah. least we're on par here. We're keeping it going. <laughs> um, so then after is most is most of your content from real life mm-hmm. stories? Do you make up any of it? Uh, I exaggerate. I don't make up any of it. It's just it's too easy. Life is you just pull from it. But um, I'll talk about. I'll do. A little topical stuff. I don't like doing topical stuff because the shit, the jokes are end up being really good, but I can't use them for a long time. So it's just like that was a fucking waste. Um, but I pull from real life experiences, um, not just mine though. I'll see something that somebody's going through, and we'll probably talk about it, and I'll probably pull something from that, and just like, oh, I can make fun of this. How do you keep the same energy when you're doing like two or three sets in a night, and you're saying the same probably jokes over? I don't know. I just like it. Mm. Just keep the energy. If you if you're not enjoying it, you're not gonna enjoy it because it's repetition over. It's the same shit over and over and over again. But it most times it's not though. It may be three sets. I may tell the joke three. I may tell the same joke three times, but I said it differently each time. Maybe an inflection or a pause or a word or something differently to make it hit harder. So, what's the longest set you've done? Mm, I did like an hour, fifteen minutes. Probably 30, 45 minutes was funny, but I was talking. It was comfortable. I was sitting on stage, and people were interested, so it just kept going. Do you prefer to go on sober or not? I don't drink and smoke, so it's just Oh, really? I think you should, though, because you don't do anything. (laughs) I don't want anybody else doing anything drunk or high. I don't want you operating on me. I don't want you giving me my (laughs) Maybe serving my food. You could be high serving my food. I don't mind it. You just like you pay extra attention. But, no, I don't drink and smoke, so... Why is that just a personal choice? Yeah, shit. smoking is cool. It's, I've been high before. It's like, oh, this is a feeling. This is cool. Um, I don't have to do this anymore. And drinking, it just don't taste good. It's just not. It's like, hey, what is this? Why do? And you see the people, the faces people make. At, it's like, why are you drinking? You don't have to. Oh, uh, but uh, this one. Do you have any rituals before you go on stage that you do? Nope. Uh, probably most common, I take a shit before I go on stage. <laughs> if I feel like I got a shit, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be a good show. And if I get a nap in before the show, I think it's going to be a really good show. So I'm just going to start implementing all those things. Maybe I'll develop a ritual. Exactly. Yeah. And how many how many shows a week do you do usually? In L.A.? Negative two. Ain't no fucking stage time out there. Unless you're famous or a writer. Uh, but typically it's mm, a week. Uh, I do a show every... I'll take that back. I do a show every Tuesday at Ha Ha Comedy Club in L.A. Um, it's Two Mike Tuesday. Me and Leonard Oots. Um... We perform there every Tuesday. And then I got a spot on Wednesday. So maybe two to three times. I say two to four, two to three times a week. And have you toured? In LA. And why did you, actually, why did you move to LA? Oh, my representation is out there. And you just want to, if you want to be in the industry, I mean, that's that's the step. It's like, yeah, you can be the biggest fish in St. Louis or Chicago, but it's just, it's the, the industry is not there. So you want to be around it. You want to be able to audition. You want to be able to submit stuff and come in. I, you can make it outside that there's no one way. I just felt like that was the best for me right now. And have you ever had doubts along the way? Like, hell yeah, yeah. boy, what? You see, and this is just an honest thing. Well, you just, you, once you in this, I'm a competitor. So it's just like you see stuff and you see things and you're like, I want that. And I think uh, doubt is coming when people, whenever you say, hear no, you're just like, why? Why not me? And that's just a little doubt, but. I don't know, I'm getting better at it now. It's just like, oh, yeah, it's going to happen. I'm telling myself it's going to happen instead of hoping it. And once that mindset shifts all the way there, I'll be fine. How do you get better as a comedian in your eyes? Mm, always learning, staying curious. How do you, what What, what have you learned thus far in the, in the three, four years you've been doing it? Stand up, I learned not just by stand up, I just learned life, just going through different things and just hopefully you taking something from situations instead of just, Always just constantly doing the same thing over and over and not changing. Uh, 
But what I've learned from stand up is patience. I've always felt like I was patient, but it's showing me that I'm not, and I just need to develop more, and it will happen. It's just taking time, and a lot of times when you ask for stuff, you're probably not even ready for it. So now all the stuff that I'm going through or the nose is like, okay, this is preparing me for this. So now I learned this from this situation, and I can apply it forward, and now that won't stop me from getting that what I needed when I wanted it. Um, how do you get funnier? How do you get better as a comic? Uh, not staying st- stuck to one thing. Not you know, I, uh, comedy is always evolving. Um, of course, funny is always first, but now people say it's being politically correct. I see it as a challenge. How can I say the same thing but less offensive? How can I get my point across? Now, do you think it's actually a big discussion these days? I don't know if you've been mm-hmm. following with um, um, I forget her name. But she made a joke about I think it was uh, XXX. Mm-hmm. The joke was funny. Yeah, yeah. but it could it would have been if she, I get why both sides are upset because as a comic I never go against comics not publicly. I may pull you to the side like man that was that wasn't cool. But I would never put it in public because I'm a comic and I wouldn't want somebody else to censor me. But on the other hand, it's it's very sensitive issue especially to the black community. Even if he was whatever he was or whatever he was accused of doing, her saying that didn't add to the joke. Mm. It was like, okay, you could have put yourself in that joke and it would have still been just as funny. It was a great joke. It, I think people missed the point of it. It was just like, okay, Cash App. Was it Cash App? Venmo, I think. Venmo, Venmo, I'm sorry. Venmo is a good idea. Instead of carrying $50,000, it could have saved your life. You could have put anybody in that situation, though. So, but I think, um, and what somebody said was, it wasn't the joke. It was the people snickering at the setup. and That shouldn't be funny. I don't think uh, a rapper's death should ever be funny to anybody, especially in light of what all the rappers that have just passed. So it may have been a culmination of those, all those in one, not just X. It was maybe they think about Tupac. Maybe they think about Biggie. Maybe they think about Nipsey most recently. So you combine all those together, it's just like those feelings are all one and the same. Why is a rapper's death funny to anybody? Right. So other than... But other than uh Rappers' deaths. Mm-hmm. When you're talking about other, politi- nothing's off limits. Okay, so for you, because there's, there's, I think in in our culture today, mm-hmm. um, the politically correct culture, mm-hmm. I think comics are now coming together and telling the people coming out to their shows and among comics, nothing's off limits. Mm-hmm. You could still say things that are messed up, but how do you find the fine line? between saying something that's probably offensive on the surface, but <laughs> still making it, like, you know, clear that you're not attacking a certain subgroup. You got to walk up to the line and cross it. You got Sometimes you got to get burnt. Oh, I, I won't do that no more. I burnt myself. All right, I'm sorry. I was just trying it out. Sometimes you walk up to the line, you cross it, and people are okay with it. And you keep walking until you can't no more. You cross it, and you keep going. That's the only way we'll know. But I think the biggest tool we need to practice is empathy. And just understand, just getting why somebody may be upset and not being so stuck to your idea of what you think is funny. You don't know what people feel about it. But if you articulate it well enough, they can't really, they can't go against it. If it's funny enough, they can't go against it because it may be offensive. But it's if it's funny enough, it'll be okay. It's palatable. What do you think is the best quality in a comic and in a joke other than obviously that it's a funny joke? Or a funny comic. Mm. Ooh, that's loaded. I don't know, cause there's so many ways that a joke could be like, oh damn, that's good. Uh, concise. If it's short, sometimes it can be long form though. Hmm. <sighs> Just making your point. I think a lot of times when I hear, hear a great joke, uh, somebody said something without saying it. They didn't go with it directly, but you knew exactly what they were talking about. And I was just like, oh, yeah, that's how you do that. I think Chris Rock does a great job of doing that a lot. Dave as well. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, especially, I saw, I was actually at the Chappelle show, or a Chappelle show mm-hmm. um, the other night. Uh, and you just, it's the way he, he says things, kind of what you said, it's like says things without saying it. Mm-hmm. Or he attacks like political issues without attacking it directly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also wonder for you, you know, how do you kind of, when you're dealing with a political issue and you're maybe in a certain place in this country Mm because you tour all around, do you alter it based on the place that you are? Hell no. 
That's why I write for everybody. Well, I don't write for everybody. I write for me, but I, I don't change the joke up. Because then if I if I change it up, it's just kind of cheating the audience. Because it's just like, oh, I got to say it like this because I think they're like... No, I think everybody is of equal intelligence in areas. And, you know, if you got enough money to come spend at a comedy club, I'm pretty sure you, uh, you're you doing a similar work or you got some type of mind, is you'll be okay. But I'm, I'm not high brain comedy though it's just i'll talk maybe about a concept that's high brow but it's just very like right here it's in your face it's not going to make you oh whoa that was i go for laughs instead of clapping so it's just like i don't change it up what's the difference between going for laughs and going for clapping that's whack you're a comedian if you want to go for claps go do something else just go for laughs i always go for the funny funny first um and you figure out everything. If you can make a point that's sweet, that's awesome. That's wonderful. But if it's not funny, I don't care how point, uh, how good that point is, it's, where's the funny? That's what that's what we're trying to get to. Do you write down physically all your jokes, or how does how does that come about? I'd always change. I type them. I write them. Put them in my notes. I put them on the back of napkins. Sometimes I just remember shit. Sometimes somebody people somebody will come up to me and say something like, "Oh, I forgot that joke. Let me go write it down." So it's all over. If you could just, I probably, I, I don't know, it's probably just loose pieces of paper, receipts paper, and just in my backpack, just stuck in there. It's probably a rallies. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably a rallies receipt there right now with some jokes on the back of it. Or just maybe a keyword or something I was thinking about. I was in a strip club last night and the girl, her titty gave me heartburn. It was very, I probably shouldn't have put a strip of titty in my mouth, but I couldn't <laughs> help it. It was in my face. And I remember tasting it. I was like, oh, this shit make my chest burn. It was just like a shot. I don't know. She wasn't lactating, so it was just, I don't know. Maybe somebody else's mouth was on it today. had some type of sauce or something. But her titty gave me heartburn. <laughs> Is that going to be featuring on your... It's going to be somewhere. It's going to be somewhere. Strippers are great. Why They're strippers very nice. great? I don't know. We uh, They're great people. They provide a service. I see what they do now. They they dance. It's, that's what it is. People need a break. Not just men. People. I've, I've seen more women in strip clubs now, which really? is fun. Yeah. Why? Why do you think that is? I don't know. It's just embracing womanhood and, and not being so judgy anymore. It's like, oh, this is fun. I see. I get it. I get the allure of a strip club. Why Interesting. Not? Um, and so you, can you talk about what it's like also uh, working in Chicago specifically? Mm -hmm. Because I think there's a lot of, the comedy scene there is very specific to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it's kind of much different than New York or LA. Mm -hmm. If you're an up and rising comedian, why do you think Chicago is is a good place to to go? I mean, you said it's mm -hmm. because they're honest. Would you say honest? And you can fail there. You can try shit out. That's how you figure out who you are. You just try shit out. How would you define yourself as a comic? What do you think your brand of comedy is like? Funny. That's yeah. that's the only thing I want to be associated. But what I've heard from other people, it, they say it's dark. I was like, well, if it's out there, and it's life, and I'm talking about it. It's not dark. Tell the shit to stop happening. I won't talk about it. But I get it. Um, sometimes it's dark. Sometimes it's intelligent. But a lot of people say it's funny. Uh, it's perspective based. I think it's easier for me to do because yeah, jokes are fun. I know how to write a good joke. But perspective is oh yeah, that's people. Once you have perspective, people want to know what you think about something. And I I have people on Instagram and my DMs and something to come up and they're like, hey, what do you think about this? And I think that's more important because it's like what I think is probably gonna be funny, but they just want to hear the perspective side of it too. So it's pretty sweet. Is there a type of comedy that you would like to kind of try out or I go try into? Musical comedy. That shit look fun, and it's a cheat code because it's a code? talent. It's people are it's so. Here's the thing: people don't see comedy as, or being funny as a talent. Because everybody thinks they're funny. And everybody is in their own right. So they don't really respect it. But if you pair it with the instrument and a comedy, it's just like, oh, this isn't fun. But I don't know how to play no instruments except for the recorder. <laughs> I feel like everybody knows how to play the recorder in America. Yeah. So I, don't, I can use that one. Um, do you feel like in comedy specifically there's one or a, just a few ways to go about writing a joke and going through that process? Or do you feel like from the experiences of talking to other comedians, there's a wide variety? And could you talk about that kind of, if there is a wide variety of ways that you've heard other people that go about, you know, 
writing their material or going over their material or mm, I know you just got to do it. That's one common thing. Uh, I know there's a setup and a punchline for every joke. You just got to find it. Some people hide it very well. The better you are, the more you hide it. Um, set up punch, set up punch. Um, there's the basic. Have you watched David Tell? Yeah. I feel like he's... Joke writer. Yeah. Just bow, 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 but bow. His punchlines are so subtle. Like he And he says them in the same tone, too. Yeah, it's just very monotone, very day. I think Dave is like one of those Jedis. I think... I haven't seen a full, complete body of work, but I enjoy his work. I mean, his, I mean, his uh, material. But I would like to see him talk about one thing for like 10 minutes and just see what he can crank out. But he just bounces around so much. His mind is crazy. Uh, who do I like? I like Dave. He could probably talk about the same thing for 15 minutes. I enjoy watching. I like Dimitri Martin. Good joke writer. Very, very. And he's a musical comedian. Uh, who else? Who else? I think. Um, do you know that? Do you know how they go about writing their jokes and if it's nah. different? Oh, um, I think Dimitri probably writes his out. Uh, Dave, I know he carries a big ass notebook, and he writes his out. And David too, I'm pretty sure he writes his shit out too. So, I, cause you see, you see them on stage sometimes, and they'll they have paper. So a lot of the newer comics, we have our phones where we look at our phone, but they have actual paper. So like, oh yeah, they wrote that out, or they just wrote out lines of it, and they just like tap into it. Do you rewatch all of your sets? No, I listen to them though. I listen to certain ones, the bad ones especially. I'm like, all right, this joke works everywhere else. Why didn't it work here? Maybe they just weren't filming me tonight, or maybe I just didn't tell it the right way. What are usually reasons that, other than potentially the crowd, that a joke doesn't can hit really well in one city, maybe not in another? Mm, time and proximity of whatever it is that's happening. If I'm talking about gun control and somebody just had a mad shooting, it was like, hey, hey, move next, please. Thank you, thank you. Trying to get away from that, but I still talk about. It. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. This is my job. I want to talk about it. And plus, it's not gonna be offensive. I try not to talk about. Uh, no, I'm lying. I was gonna say I try not to talk about that. I talk about dead people. I talk about everybody. Uh, but yeah, it's just the proximity and the timing of it, and that's uh, usually what happens. And what's the? Do you have one particular favorite moment from touring around the whole country that you can that you can think of? Mm. What did I have the most fun at? Have you been to most places, would you say? Uh, I I say about half the states. There's some states I don't even want to go to, like South Dakota. I don't give a fuck who up there. I'm not going <laughs> well, Yeah, I had to pay me. You ain't got to pay me a lot, just enough. But I was like, this only a day, please. Um, I've been to most places. Uh, I, I do want to do comedy in um Seattle. I don't know why. It just seems like it's fun. It doesn't seem like a comedy scene. Uh, one particular moment that I had a great time. It's always the after show shit. It's the whoever you want to roll with and you go hang out with. Like I, I travel a lot with uh Leonard Oates, funny dude from uh Chesapeake, Virginia. Hilarious. Probably one of the funniest human beings. And I swear to God, and we just we can sit there and laugh for hours about nut Vegas. That's where we're at. We had a great time in Vegas. We had a um he flew a young lady out, and it didn't go well. And we just talked about this shit all week. And it's just, we just had, we stayed with probably like six o'clock in the morning just joking, laughing. Why didn't it work out? I don't know, shit. That's between them two. <laughs> shit just ain't work out. <laughs> wasn't sweet for him. So and he wasn't mad about it. It was just funny. Is that where you, do you also try out some jokes with? Hell friends? yeah. Spe people you, tr you trust, though. People who get your humor. You're like, hey, bro, what you think about this? All right, what, what about this line? And most of the time we'll be like, oh, man, that shit whack, bro. And sometimes like, ooh, can I have it? I gave I gave you like can we have that? So we just swap it out and yeah, that's who you try. That's who's hers at first. Or you can try in a conversation. Like if I wanted to bring up a joke, like the the stripper titty I was like, ah, oh, I brought it up. Okay, it got a little laugh. All right, that's funny somewhere. I'm gonna try it out. Let me put it in my act somewhere. So yeah. How do you kind of once you have an idea or like with the with the stripper joke, how do you kinda of like mold it into then mm. finding that punchline? That that right there, and I'll just talk about. Maybe I'll just throw that out there. Maybe I'll just say that line, and it's funny enough, and I just start going. Cause I feel like every man has almost put a titty in his mouth in strip club. You wanted to, you just didn't do it. You were scared. Now you should be scared because you might get your heart burned. But you just try it out. Or sometimes, uh, I like I remember as a kid I would read books, but I would go to the end first, and I want to know what happened. Like, oh, okay, cool. 
and now I can read the rest of the book, and now I feel perfectly Wait, fine. Wait, really? So you could read the end of the book, and then, but doesn't it? So I don't point care. Of... I don't care. And I'll just read. I'm like, okay, I know what's going to happen, but I'm still, it's just like watching the movie over. You know what's going to happen. You still enjoy, I enjoy Castaway yeah, every don't, time. Don't, don't you like the buildup of the movie to the, no? Don't matter. But would you still read the full book if you already knew the end? Yes. I read them all. Read them all, just like that. I re- a lot of the books I'm reading now, though, it don't matter where I read because it's a lot of self help and shit like that. So it's like you can open up any chapter and just like, oh, okay, yeah. But growing up fiction, I don't, I didn't care. I was just reading. But now, but going back to joke writing, I would, I can start with a punchline, and then build around it. Like the stripper joke about the titty, bam, I could go build from there to there, 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 and then boom, that could be the the, the end all. Uh, well, the end, that's the punchline, and, and I build backwards. I think a lot of times that's what happens, though. You hear something, and it's you got to bring the context to it, and then you can build around it. We're going to take a quick break. Cool, cool, Because we've got to talk about Manscaped. Support for Where's This Going comes from Manscaped, who is number one in men's below-the-belt grooming. Vincent? How much do you pay for that shit? Like, <laughs> that's what I, Do we get a discount if you prom- promo on it? Yes, you do. All right. You want 20% off? 20% off? Yeah, yeah. I'll use it. 20% you, off you to any, shave my balls. Do you have any manscaping uh, stories for us? No, nah, wrong manscape. I don't... Uh, How you do know you, what? I used scissors last yeah. time, which is probably not a good idea, but hey, ain't nobody going to see that hair. And if you judge me off my pubic hair, it's just like, hey, man, you down there for the wrong shit. <laughs> don't, just, don't body shame me because I mm. choose hair to have hair on my private... Uh, ah, pubic hair is useful. I think everything on your body is useful. It's to protect you. So it's, you shouldn't be walking around wanting to be young in that area anyway. It's, just, I, it's weird. Hmm. Well, lucky for you, Manscaped offers, so you don't have to use scissors. Hmm. They offer precision engineered tools for all <laughs> of your family <laughs> jewels. <laughs> so in a lab making tools, like, no, nah, these are going to be cutting. No, this is, this is strictly for... I think that what happened is... They was designing something else and didn't mm. work out, and they was like, you know what? This could be used on the male genitalia. There it is. That's why Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. The, their Lawn Mower 2.0 Lawn Mower has proprietary skin safe technology so this trimmer won't nick or snag your nuts. <sighs> yeah. Manscaping accidents are finally a thing of the past. And I don't know what your thoughts on this, but. Please don't use the same trimmer on your face that you're using. On I would your hope not. That's disgusting. And if you, well, if, I don't know. I can't judge you. If you're in that kind of shit, do your thing, man. But I'm not doing it. They also have the Crop Preserver. If you're wondering what that is, it's an anti chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. I don't think that's cool, bro. I think we should just, look, we mess with our bodies too much. We just fucking it up. Ball deodorant. What? No. <laughs> Who is sniffing balls? Who is your ball? Ba- put some hot water and then it, they balls should smell like nothing. They shouldn't have a fragrance. Mm. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they should be a little musky. Who knows? Who like a, who? Maybe some some girls. I've been with girls who like gamey nuts. Really? They like it. They like to the smell what men smell like. Mm. I don't want to do them the disservice. You already put deodorant on your armpits. This is tr- sometimes natural deodorant. <laughs> so. Why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest part of your body? Because I'm not hugging people with my nuts. <laughs> That's a good point. I didn't think about that. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WTG at manscaped.com. Always use the right tools for the job. Vincent, your balls will thank you. Balls can't talk, but if they could, I don't think they want to be shaved. That is 100%. You don't think they want to be shaved? No, nah, man. They got hair for a reason. Okay. Hair is there to protect you. So, and my balls ain't even that hairy. Who got hairy balls? That's I have a pubic hair, but hairy balls. It's like you sick. Something wrong. Get twenty percent off and free shipping with the code WTG at manscaped.com. That is twenty percent off with free shipping using code WTG. Whew. That was a long ad for balls, man. It it was, but some people need it. This is true. Um, what do you like to do in your free time other than hit the strip club when you're not? Working, uh, I enjoy reading. It's very fun. <laughs> what reading you... and titties. No, I'm <laughs> reading. And, if I could read, I read. A, I played Tetris in the strip club last night too. I was kind of <laughs> bored. I got my dance. I was like, oh, I'm ready to go, bro. I've been aroused. Uh, for fun, <laughs> I hoop. 
I'll go do I'll go play basketball. I don't like to be too serious though. I play with people who are on my level. People mm-hmm. who don't give a fuck just as much as me. Because if you're playing with people who really think they still gonna make it, it's just like this ain't fun, bro. I can feel your passion in this game and I'm not that passionate about it. Um I you, enjoy a good movie. What's your favorite movie? Oh. What is my favorite movie? I am Sam. With Sean Penn. You ever seen it? I think I have. Boy, it's so good. Sean Penn, Dakota Fanning. Uh, I think that's Nicole Kidman. It's about a people, a person, a man, a man, Sean Penn, uh, who is um, mentally challenged, but he has a daughter, so he's fighting for custody before. It also, it's a tearjerker. I cried. It's a good movie. Though. Are you a crier? Of course. It's healthy. Mm. It's healthy. And we talked about a little. Um, I was thinking about it. We talked earlier about when you're working with um, people with mental health problems. Mm-hmm. What kind of led you into that, and what was, what exactly did you do? in that field? So the first four years when I was in college, I was an aide. Basically, I would give these guys medication. I would fix them food. I would clean their house. I would take them on outings. Was it more elderly people or just people of all ages? Uh, people of all ages. Uh, well, it was adults. And then in Chicago, when I first moved there, I had a job in a behavioral health facility uh, with children ages from 5 to 17. We would get some as young as 3, though, little kids. And uh, that shit is dark. It is it's like, yeah, I didn't come to Chicago to do this. And I was drained and I was mentally worn out and I was just sad for them all the time because they're children and they're not given a chance at, at any, they're not even given the chance at a chance. It's just like, oh shit, this is it for some of these kids. And it was uh, very disheartening. Um, Why did you first get into that field of work? Uh, how did I, I needed a job and that was the most flexible thing. And then I kind of stuck with it because that was what my my degree was in uh, criminology. So that's human services, basically. So I was in the people, I mean, the, the business of serving people. So it was cool for a while. And then it wasn't. And then do you have a, I'm not going to say favorite, but do you have a, a moment that stuck with you from working there that you'll kind of take with you for the rest of your life? Mm. This is getting a little dark, but a kid that was four said he wanted to kill himself. And I was like, what? How do you feel that at four? And he was dead ass serious. So I, that, that's dark, but it's not a favorite, but that's the most memorable. How do they have kids that young in, and they know that they need to go to that so, level? Yeah, they help. don't know, but the, the behaviors are a little different. Like what, what are some of the behaviors? Um, some kids don't talk. Some kids are very violent, very aggressive. Some kids... Mm, is it mostly... a from because of where they're from, because of family life. It's a combination of things. So it could be uh, we've had a, we had all kinds of kids from all uh, different backgrounds. Uh, so it's more so about the brain's chemical balance, and if it's off a little bit, or maybe they need the medication, or maybe they just didn't get a hug. That's an important. Affection is really important when you're raising children because if you grow up without love, it kind of shows. So. Uh, it's a combination of shit. But we can't prescribe love to kids. We need medicine. So I think that's the fucked up part. And I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, like you said, where they come from, the environment they're, they're around. So in Chicago, it's not as violent as people make it seem. But in certain areas, just like everywhere else, the concentrated areas, it is violent. And some of those kids don't know how to process the emotions that goes with whatever they're seeing. So they internalize and then they re- react differently. And sometimes the teachers may not know how to handle that. And it's labeled as something else versus, oh, this kid is just grieving right now. Mm. Oh, he's sad. Oh, that kid is hungry. That's why he's lashing out. Oh, shit, his mom is addicted to it. Oh, his dad isn't around. So, it's, oh, okay. Versus looking at it like that, it's labeling as a problem. And then they get sent to facilities like where I was at or juvenile or, or jail. So, Would you ever develop a... Uh, like a friendship with any of the kids, or would they ask you for help? It's limits. Or advice? It's limits. Yeah, you give them advice within the in those guidelines, but you kind of have to save yourself. You got to save some of yourself, especially when you're dealing with things like social work and shit like that, because you got to go home. You need to be able to turn it off, and so most times you can't because you're taking some of that shit home. The story's so heavy, the files that you read, some of the stuff that you see these kids go through, you just can't cut that shit off. It's like seeing a really violent film and trying to like watch. You remember the Kill Bill scene when she was cutting all those people? Yeah. Yeah, you. And it's like that before a child. You're like, oh shit, I can't cut this off. So, um, 
But yeah, you develop the bond as much as you can. And sometimes I would see my kids walking out and about in Chicago after they've been released from the facility or whatever. And sometimes they'd be doing well and sometimes they'd be doing bad. But, you know, you just check in on that, but you keep it at a distance because you don't never want those lines to be crossed. What would you say is the state of mental health in America and how it's being kind of addressed from like a, you know, a social worker or a governmental standpoint? From our standpoint, it is awesome because now people are recognizing it as such. But in, on the other hand, I think people are, <sighs> I said people are wearing anxiety like it's an accessory now. It's like, oh, I have anxiety. It's like Gucci for them. It's like, nigga, that's not cool. That's because you, now you're in the way of people who really are. But you can't say that because you can never see somebody. But you can see, it's like, oh, this is your excuse. It's almost like when people blame shitty behavior on, oh, I'm an Aquarius. Motherfucker, that ain't got nothing to do with you being a bad person. When you were born, when your parents decided when to have sex, decided how you were going to act as a person, it's terrible. Uh, it's, um, it's beautiful. It's a catch-22 always when shit like this happens because now it's finally being recognized, but it's also people are, are attaching shitty behaviors. They're like, no, you, you don't have anxiety. You just don't know how to talk to people. You don't, you know, but you can't actually say that because people get offended. You're like, you don't know what I've been through. It's like, kind of do. I know you, but I. And how do you keep your mental health in check with the, like, the, the background that you have? Oh, man, I don't. I'm insane. I go in front of people and talk about my life. I'm insane. That's how. Maybe comedy. Um, I communicate very well. I talk to people. I let people know how things make me feel. So I just don't go away from a situation. If it made me feel bad, I'm going to let the person know it made me feel bad. Because if you take it away and they don't know, they're going to go about their day. But you're going to sit there and own it. But I always feel bad when I express myself. And I don't always angrily. I just pull them to the side. Like, hey, man, that, don't, that, that made me feel like this. Is comedy uh, a form of therapy for you? Mm, kind of, sort of, when it's going well. <laughs> but when you bombing, ooh, you remember everything somebody said to you that was bad. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, it can be. It's very therapeutic to make other people laugh. and Very egotistical, too. It's just like, i got some thoughts in my head that will make you laugh, and I'm going to prove it. Um, do you feel like you can kind of... Do you feel more powerful because of you Of course. Can... I am a Jedi. I am a mind bender. I'm a perspective changer. Of course I feel like that. But the rest of the world don't be knowing that. You operate that and you're like, oh, I wish you would have seen me on stage. You would treat me differently. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like it's a special power. And you got to use it the right way, though. What would you? What do you think you'd be doing right now if, if you weren't in, doing comedy? I'd probably have, like, a two-family flat. I was interested in real estate and shit like that back home. I was going to get some property. And real estate is one of those things to where you can have things and you can acquire money and you can uh, still move around freely versus where working a job is like you're stuck in one place. But if I got a property, I can just, you know, collect my money and dip out and bounce out, move around. You would get property back in St. Louis? Yeah, yeah. And the Tower Grove area where I grew up across the street from the park is very nice. Um, I love the South Side. It's very artsy. I probably maybe get like a four family flat, live in one of the rooms. I mean, live in one of the places and rent out the other three and have a source of income like that. Do you go back often? No, I'm trying to. Oh, well, last time I was back home, when was it? Uh, I want to say Christmas. I haven't been back since then. I'll, I'm going back uh, to do a gig and I'm going to stay down in like two, three days. I need to go see my mom and things like that. And for you, what do you kind of see? What do you see Vincent Bryan in 10 years? Mm, selling out theaters across the nation. Oh, uh, yeah, that's where I see myself. Um, hopefully by then I, I would have sold some shows and started. Well, not even started. I would like a guest star. Guest starring is cool. You come in, you do your part. People are like, hey, I like this character. And then they come to the comedy club. And it's just, just a touring comedian. And um, making at least... Six figures on the road. That'd be great for me. And is there somebody that, if you could pick one person mm -hmm. to open for them, who would it be? Right now? Right now. Uh, who audience do I like the most? I would pick I would pick somebody opposite of me just to make me a better comic. So maybe like Amy Schumer or something like that. I would pick uh, as an older white woman. <laughs> nah, I say older. She'd feel bad if I said older. I don't care. An older white woman... That demographic, I was have like, oh. Have I you was, met her? No, nah, I haven't met Amy. She seems cool, though. She seems all right. 
She's funny. She a comic. We all the same. Do you get competitive amongst comics? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, but some some comics don't like it. It's like, man, you should just really compete with Nope. I want to be the best one on this show. I want people to come and tell me you were the best. But nah, I, I get competitive. I just it's just a natural thing for me to be competitive because we could talk about the same shit, but I got a better take on it. All right, cool. It just makes me enhance my game. I think that's what competition makes me better. So that's why I applied to comedy too. Where's this competition in your life stem from originally, you think? Uh, uh Were you always competitive? Yeah, yeah. I don't and when I would I was gonna say sports, but it's not from sports. I don't give a fuck if it was a game of Connect Four. I wanna win. And I'm gonna play until I win. Until I figure it out. I, that's and I would be in tears if I'm losing. I, I'm a sore loser. I don't know why people I'm not like disrespectful. It's just like I don't like losing. It's a feeling inside me. It's just I feel it. So I don't know. That's where it comes from. Do you think more about your for me personally, like I, I'm always, I don't really think about the wins, only about the losses. So, mm. Cause I feel like it's when you win, it's normal that you won. Or yeah, it's I'm supposed to. You're supposed to. Mm -hmm. But then, how do you handle losses or rejections? Uh, rejections are different. It's just like, do you right. feel like you feel like losses and rejections are are different? Yeah, cause I, I see how they could be same, but for me, it's it just depends. Like if somebody's told me no, it's like, oh, that's not a loss. It's their loss, <laughs> kind of. So no, I'm just kidding. That's a, no, but uh, rejection is like, oh, you can learn from it. Why? I always try to see why they would have said it. And if I can't, un that's when it bothers me, when I don't understand why. But if oh, if I present you a show idea, and like, oh, this is something similar. That's a rejection. But it's like, oh, that I know why. But if you're just saying no to say no because it's like, oh, that's a good idea. Why not? That's when it would bother me, maybe a little bit. Um, losses, how do I deal with losses? Mm, rematch. <laughs> Run it back. <laughs> Can we play again? Uh, sometimes what, what's an example of a loss in the, in the comedic world? Mm, what's an example of a bombing on TV? Because that's what you're always preparing for. Because TV lasts forever. A set is only that during that time. But if I would have bombed on Heart of the City, that would have been forever. That's on film. That's on scratch. So that's what that's a loss, I think. How nervous were you when you went on, before you went on? I was Really? That was the weird part. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to shine. I I think partially because I seen two other comics go before me. I was like, oh yeah, they ain't nothing like me. It's not a bad thing. It's just different, and I'm just gonna give them a different take on it and different flavor. And I just knew I was the room was hot. I was just ready. How do you find that confidence in yourself? To do you ever think about it? Kind of take a step back, and you're like, I'm about to go in front of hundreds or maybe thousands of people, mm -hmm. and every single one of their eyes is gonna be on me. Does that ever creep you out? No, I don't mind it. It's because I'm not, I'm, I'm because the crowd is one thing. It's a crowd. It's just one. So it's, I'm just talking to one crowd, not people individually. Sometimes I'll go into the crowd. I'll make connections with people and I'll talk to them, and but that's on purpose. I'll make it. I'll going back and forth. But I know everybody's listening because that's the best conversation. Sometimes when you eavesdropping on somebody else's shit, so I make it feel like the rest of the audience is eavesdropping on our conversation. But it's really for everybody. And how many would you say that you think of? about your jokes and about comedy and how to get better mm -hmm. all day? Is it is it constantly on your mind? Oh, man, it don't stop. It's not supposed to because your eyes are always supposed to be on. You're supposed to recognize. That's how you always generate new material. And I talk, I'm starting to talk to people more. I'm making a conscious effort just to learn more about people. And I, I notice I'm funny in conversation, so if I'm talking to people, I can just pull some shit out of that. And just not being to myself so much because now in the entertainment industry I had learned uh, this is already established. They, You know what this does. They don't know what I do so I have to come bearing gifts. I have to be open. I have to talk. I have to, you know, versus where I'm so used to just chilling and being reserved and just like, I'm, I'm cool. I'm relaxing. But that ain't the case now. And I'm also kind of curious as to, you know, for yourself who's also, I mean, compared to other people, still very new mm -hmm. kind of to comedy. How do you feel like you can, like, find your place in comedy and and not, you know, I think for, you can see some comedians think that they have a, more success or they have a bigger ego than they actually do. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, you can kind of feel when, you know, I've been to shows, there's a little, like a little arrogance or there's this, like, feeling of, oh, I'm, 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 I'm better than 
better than maybe I am at that point in life. How do you kind of like ground yourself, stay humble, and still realize like, look, I'm I'm very good at what I do. Oh, you just go watch better comics. <laughs> You're like, damn. <laughs> as long as you stay a fan of comedy, you'll never. I think I don't think you'll ever get to that point where you're like, oh, I'm better than all. Because it's always something new. It's always something fresh. It's always an original joke. Even a bre- even a brand new open mic can come with a joke that's so original. You be like, God damn! If you can get ten more of those, you're gonna be better than everybody out there. Cause that take is so fresh, and I learned from that. So it's just like I'm always improving. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? But, mm, uh, as far as like life, or comedy, life and comedy. Uh, life is probably for my dad. You, just, you can be whatever you want to be, and that was just almost like an affirmation. He told me that all the time, and I could see that in my head. And it was like, oh, you can be whatever you want to be, and I know that. Uh, as far as comedy goes, um, it's cliche as fuck, but it's stay on stage and 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 find yourself. Find yourself. Before, you find yourself. You can just go up there and be yourself. Do you feel like you find yourself as a comedian? Not yet. I'm close. I'm knocking on the door. I have certain jokes I can say. I'm like, oh, I can tell this joke in any era and it'll be funny. What do you think when you say close? What's that mean? Is it because you still? I don't know how to. Do you feel like it's it's a comfort thing? Like you you're already comfortable, but you could be more comfortable. Yeah, I could be way more comfortable. I could be more more relaxed. I can just go up there. And, once you can go up there and just talk. If you you ever watched the Jay Z interview? With uh yeah or it's period. Yeah, you, just talk, you can just listen to him. It's all it's almost like he talking in rhymes. It's all it comes back around. You're like, oh shit, that's smooth. And then I watch a Chris Rock interview. I watch a Dave Chappelle interview. They talk and joke. Once you get to that point, and it's like, oh shit, I don't even recognize what I'm doing. I'm I get every once in a while when I'm on, it's just coming out like ba ba ba. I can be funny when I I can just punch, land a punchline when I can just set it up. Are you ever thinking about jokes before? Like, what's going on through your head while you're while you're on stage? Because I always when I'm watching comedy, I'm like, wow, like they're you know. Usually most people are just nonstop, and you wonder, like, are they thinking about this, like, two or three jokes before? Is this all planned out? Is it mm-hmm. they're just lo- so locked in that they just know what to do or say? If I'm bored, I'm probably thinking about what I'm eating after the show. I know the joke working. I'm like, all right, I got time. Oh, damn, I'm hungry. I know my fucking food getting cold in the green room. And then they settle down, and it's back. But if you're on and you engage and the audience is fun, you in and out. you weaving. It's just like... You ever see a fast break? It's like that, a great one, though. That's constantly just, it's just firing. But if you're not having fun, it's just like, this shit is all day. I can't wait to be done to get off this stage. Because sometimes audiences just suck. They just stink. They laughing, but they just suck. Y'all suck tonight. Y'all could be way better. I could be better possibly, too, but I I can feel y'all energy. I stink right now. And then you gotta, and then once you gotta work them out of that stinky phase, like you guys would have had so much more fun if you wouldn't have been stinky at first. But yeah, shit like that. Did you watch a lot of comedy growing up? Yeah, I used to sneak, stay up and watch Comedy View, and me, Comedy Central and BET were a click away. So I was just going back and forth, not even realizing. I was just watching TV all night, just staying up when I wasn't supposed to, watching Def Jam and shit like that, and didn't even know I would be doing it. When people are gonna think of Vincent Bryant mm-hmm. in twenty years, fifty, fifty-five years down the line, boy, he was a funny motherfucker. Yeah, hopefully they can still use my jokes to defeat logic or ideas that are out there today. That's what I want. It's almost like I want to be like a philosopher. I'm a school of thought. <laughs> the Vincent Bryant school of thought. Yeah, that'd be dope. You can find Vincent on Instagram and Twitter at vbryant9. Yes, sir. The website, great website. Thank you. Uh, vbryant9.com. What's the 9 stand for? Uh, it was a football number, and I just stuck. And you know how you create a username, they won't let you just use vbryant. I was like, all right, let me put the 9 on there. Gotcha. Um, you can find on his website, that has it'll have your updated dates. and Yeah, uh, cool. updates. Um, he has a podcast as well. Yep. Consistently inconsistent. Yeah, that's my life, man. Check, check it out on Apple's podcast app. And yep, yep. 
most platforms? Uh, yeah, in SoundCloud for sure. Yeah. Perfect. Vincent, thank you so much for taking I appreciate the time today. It. Yeah. Where is this going? It went Where? everywhere. Exactly. It was great, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.